I'm now joined by Samir Santi. He is an assistant professor over at the CUNY School of Labor and Urban Studies, and he has just published a new piece in the print issue of Jacobin called Red the Fed. We'll be talking to him today about all things inflation and the Federal Reserve, of course. Samir, good to see you. Thanks, Jen. It's great to be here. So uh, obviously, as we are recording this, the Federal Reserve is actually holding its September meeting as we speak. Uh, you know, they have basically already announced another red, uh, another rate hike, interest rate hike. And, you know, the, the Jerome Powell, the Fed chair, has been, I think, pretty open that he would really like to just keep raising rates as high as he can until like inflation is over, right? So uh, the last time you were on the show to talk about inflation, we kind of covered this, uh, but I, I think it's good to just sort of summarize or, or start on this point. Uh, what does the Fed want to happen when they raise interest rates? And what's wrong with this approach? Sure. Um, so the Fed operates with a very particular interpretation of why inflation is occurring right now. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, if we if follow the debates around this, there's a few different interpretations. One that we heard a lot in over the past year is about supply chains, right? That the price increases that we've seen are the result of a bunch of pandemic related and then subsequently um, you know, Russian and Ukraine related supply shocks. Mm -hmm. So that's one interpretation, but the Fed operates uh, according to a different one, which is that inflation is the result of too much demand in the economy right now, too much spending power. That's visible through things like the unemployment rate being quite low and workers having bargaining power to raise wages based on their position mm -hmm. of security. And so the logic, if the inflation results from too much demand, the solution is then to reduce the amount of demand. Right. And so the Fed does this by raising interest rates. And, and the way it's sort of a just sort of a obscure mechanism, but if you think about it, it makes sense, right? That when when interest rates go up, it's harder to borrow. It's harder to get a mortgage and buy a home, which means the housing industry slows down. It's harder for businesses to borrow and invest, which means business activity slows down. All of this together means the economy begins to slow. And when the economy slows, unemployment rises. Mm -hmm. And when unemployment rises, workers have less bargaining power and less ability to raise wages mm -hmm. collectively. So, mm -hmm. so really what the Fed's trying to do is weaken workers' ability to raise their wages and in so doing limit the pressure that they perceive as resulting from this excess demand, excess mm -hmm. demand in relation to the amount of supply. So it really is quite striking that it's a class interpretation that the Fed is operating up, um, on. You know, we got too much demand, and the way that we deal with this is through undermining workers' bargaining power, limiting demand, possibly through a recession. Now, mm -hmm. Powell says he doesn't want to create a recession. He hopes that he can kind of slow things down without creating too much collateral damage. And it's possible that he's sincere about that. But the bottom line is that's that's the rationale. Mm -hmm. I, I definitely want to talk more about the kind of class aspect that you mentioned. Uh, but I also want to ask you, like, how and why did raising interest rates become this de facto method of fighting inflation? Uh, because something that you hinted at is, you know, that's not necessarily a good solution, uh, but that's what the U.S. has been doing for decades. Uh, how did this come about? Yeah, I mean, I guess I should say just kind of on building on the previous comment, if in fact you believe that inflation is to at least some significant degree the result of these supply issues, Reducing demand is not going to do much about that, right? right? Reducing demand doesn't change the fact that oil prices have been rising. Now they're coming down a little bit, but doesn't do anything about the fact that, you know, supply chains from China and elsewhere have been disrupted as a result of the pandemic um, and, you know, the ongoing policy in China. Doesn't do anything about that. What it does is reduce, just again, reduce demand and take a toll on workers' ability to spend. So where that comes from is... I mean, it's it's a it's become over the last generation the response 
to inflation. And the origin of this is really in the 1970s. Now, even before the 1970s, the Fed responded to inflationary pressure through interest rate increases. This, you know, in the 50s and 60s, they were doing similar versions of this. But the real model that the Fed's operating on right now started in the 1970s and was sort of epitomized by Paul Volcker, who was mm -hmm. the chair of the Fed in the late 1970s and then, you know, through the through most of the 80s. He was appointed by Jimmy Carter, notably. And he, in response to ongoing inflation through that decade, which is of a different variety than what we're experiencing now, inflation can result from a variety of different causes. But in response to that inflation, which proved intractable, right, and had a number of causes that we could potentially talk about, he felt the only way to really get it under control was to weaken the organized working class's ability to raise wages. And the logic there was that wherever inflation is coming from, it, you know, it could be coming from an oil shock. It could be coming from broader kind of secular long term trends in the economy. Wherever it's coming from, it becomes a problem when it gets baked into the expectations of workers, businesses, and so on. When people expect more inflation, then they act in such a way that creates it. It becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. And the diagnosis of the 70s from Volcker was that whatever the cause of inflation is, the problem was that workers had come to anticipate it. And at the time, the labor movement was much stronger and unions had cost of living agree you know, agreements and other, other protections. And we're bidding up wages in anticipation of further price increases. And so in order to get anything under control in Volcker's view, we had to eliminate the expectation of further price increases. And the way that you eliminate that expectation is weakening the power of workers to act on that expectation, which is through, again, weakening the power of organized labor specifically. And Volcker was very clear about this. And so his action was to raise rates considerably to almost 20 percent and provoke an extremely severe recession in 1980, 1981 that the U.S. labor movement has really never recovered from. And it worked. You could say, right? I mean, inflation did come down and inflation remained relatively stable over the next few decades. And in a sense, Volcker's action ratified this interpretation, right? It, it proved the um, effectiveness of using interest rates as the mechanism to combat inflation. Now, if, if you know, had he not done that, it might have taken a whole set of other tools, yeah. that addressed the actual causes in that particular historical moment. Interest rates, if you take them high enough, they will work because at a certain point, when interest rates rise to a certain level, the economy is going to slow and a slowing economy will eliminate some of the pressure mm -hmm. on prices. So what exactly does this particular approach to fighting inflation sort of tell us about the role of the central bank today? Uh, because, you know, your piece looks at a few historical examples of when the Federal Reserve operated kind of differently. And I want to get to that next. Uh, but but yeah, again, just what does this like interest rate hike uh, centric model of fighting inflation tell us about the role of the Fed right now? Yeah, I mean, it, it's central banks and the Federal Reserve, you know, they're, they're, you know, you maybe hear about these things, right? The, the Federal Reserve, the Bank of England, the Bank of Japan, right? They're, they're in the air. But like, what exactly they do is, I think, often very unclear. And I think a, an important point to emphasize is that over the last generation or more, right, what we might call for a sake of simplicity, the neoliberal era, central banks have been the principal architects of economic policy. They've been, we could call this, you know, the neoliberal era, we could just as well call it the age of the central bank. Mm -hmm. And what the central bank and what the Federal Reserve sees as, as its responsibility is two things. One, maintaining stable prices, avoiding inflation at all costs. And two, ensuring that conditions for the financial sector's operation are stable and and well managed, and that could involve at times of crisis diving in and and you know undertaking enormous rescue operations like we saw in two thousand and eight, like we saw again in twenty twenty. But the two are related in that you know financial ma market prosperity is conditional upon stable prices, the elimination of inflation. At least that's how they see it. And so, in the first place, always maintaining price stability is the sort of reason of the Fed's existence in the modern era. So that, that's, that's where it comes from. I'm not sure if I've totally answered. I'm maybe 
spaced a little bit on what the entirety of the question is, but that's, that's where it comes from. Yeah. Yeah. No, I was just interested in, um, yeah, like the role of the central banks right now, uh, because what I really wanted to dive into is, you know, your your piece lays out some really interesting examples of how the Federal Reserve operated differently in the past. And I think the most kind of striking era of comparison is, of course, the New Deal. Um, I, I, I believe you write in, in your piece that, you know, the role of the Fed has been contested pretty much throughout the course of the 20th century. Right. So uh, let's talk about the New Deal a little bit. Um, the obviously, you know, this was a period in which the Federal Reserve operated quite differently than it does now. Uh, how exactly did it function during that era? And, and how did this come to be? Yeah, so I guess the, the contrast is maybe helpful for kind of digging into that, right? Right. Again, the Federal Reserve, to your question, their objective in the modern era is ensuring that the financial sector can operate and 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 accumulate profits and 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 continue in a stable fashion. And in times when crisis occurs, the Fed's got to step in to rescue it. But it's about the financial sector. It's about financial sector accumulation, maintaining the conditions for profitable accumulation within the financial sector is the Fed's reason of existence right now. That's not always been the case, Mm -hmm. right? The Federal Reserve need not be preoccupied solely with financial market conditions. And in the past, it had other priorities. So to take the New Deal example, I mean, the Federal Reserve was established in 1914. There's a long kind of history behind its its genesis. But moving to the Great Depression, it was clear that significant public investment, right, government expenditure was going to be necessary to get the economy out of depression. And this is, you know, Keynesianism is a term that sort of some people may be familiar with that originates in this period, John Maynard Keynes is an economist in the 1930s. And the idea was that government's got to spend to resuscitate a stagnant economy. And government spending can happen through really two ways, right? One is through taxing and spending. But when the economy is in deep depression, a high level of taxation could only further exacerbate the problems. And so in times like that, the government's got to borrow in order to spend, right? Government deficits are necessary to kickstart a stagnant economy. And the government has to borrow from somewhere, right? And has to borrow at rates, at interest rates, right? It has to pay back that debt in time. Um, the Federal Reserve in the 1930s, as a result of reforms that were implemented in the early 1930s under the Roosevelt administration, committed itself to ensuring that the government could borrow at reasonable rates so that it could service those debts over time in a sustainable way. And so that ultimately it could implement the New Deal Mm -hmm. and and subsequently finance World War II. Mm -hmm. World War II is a massive, massive program of public investment. And in order to achieve that, the government needed low cost loans, right? Effectively, right? Mm -hmm. Effectively, that's what it needed, right? And the Federal Reserve committed itself through from you know the mid 1930s through the ni- the late 1940s to ensuring that the federal government would be able to borrow at reasonable rates to finance all of the public investment that was needed in you know first for the new deal and second for world war 2 uh, sort of building off of that, um, you know, we we tend to think of the New Deal as a time of uh, increased banking regulations, right? How did the Fed uh, kind of factor into that? Yeah, so I mean, the the depression is in part so severe because of widespread banking failures that mm-hmm. occur, you know, from basically ni- starting in nineteen twenty nine through 19- the early nineteen thirties, nineteen thirty three, and. One of the first orders of business of the Roosevelt administration is reforming the banking system. Mm -hmm. And so there's a couple big, you know, pieces of legislation that are implemented in 1933 and 1935. And the the legacies of those are in some ways still with us, right? Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, the FDIC, which insures all of our deposits, that originates in that period. There was also another measure called Glass-Steagall, which Mm -hmm. separated investment banks from commercial banks, right, to ensure that consumer deposits wouldn't be used in speculative fashion and then blow up and leave people with nothing, right? So those are kind of the, the famous um, legacies of New Deal banking legislation. But those laws also um, bore on the Federal Reserve. Mm-hmm. And it did so in a couple ways. One was its centralized authority within the Federal Reserve 
in Washington in what's called the Board of Governors. When the Fed was established in 1914, it was very decentralized, and that decentralization prevented it from acting in an efficient way in response to crisis. So one thing that you know the Banking Acts did was centralize authority so that Washington, the Washington-based board could you know, quickly, effectively respond. The other thing it did is grant the Federal Reserve Board authority to regulate banks, right? In addition to, if we're going to, you know, ad, you know, address credit conditions so that the government can borrow at reasonable rates, you also have to ensure that Wall Street isn't going to exploit that um, in speculative ways like mm-hmm. we've seen over the last decade. And so the Fed was granted the authority to impose and enforce regulations on banks to guarantee that that wouldn't happen. So those are the two things that come out of the banking legislation. And those two features of the Fed are still with us today. They still are largely run centrally through Washington. There are, you know, reserve banks around the country, but the Washington-based Board of Governors, which is meeting right now, they're the ones who are the real, in the driver's seat. Mm -hmm. And the Fed is still, uh, has the authority to regulate the banking system. And they do, but one might say not adequately. Mm -hmm. So maybe let's now talk about uh, how the Fed kind of went from this New Deal model to what we have today. Uh, You had previously mentioned World War II. uh, And and maybe the question here is, how exactly did the Fed decide to deal with inflation during World War II? And and I believe you say in your piece that, you know, this this sort of marks a turning point for monetary policy in the U.S. So so what happened during World War II? Yeah, yeah. No, this is great. This is a really crucial period, right? World War II to the early 1950s is one of the most consequential periods of modern U.S. history. Um, and and it's often not appreciated for its significance. So during World War II, again, I mean, massive, massive federal expenditure on the defense mobilization. You know, there, there, there's a stat that's just kind of wild. Between, during the war, the federal government, the value of federal investment in you know, plant and equipment, factories and productive facilities all over the country was equivalent to 50 percent of the total private capital stock in 1941. Right. I mean, it's like enormous right amount of federal investment to to wage the war effort. All of this is enabled by a cooperative Federal Reserve, the Fed maintaining the credit conditions, right, the borrowing conditions so that the Treasury Department could finance the war effort. So this persists right through the war. It's crucial to the success. Now, when you've got that kind of a demand, right, massive federal investment, huge amount of demand, favorable borrowing conditions, growing budget deficits, right? This these are the conditions that could create significant inflation. Mm -hmm. Right. Those are potentially inflationary conditions. But during World War Two, there's hardly any inflation. And the reason is, in addition to what the Federal Reserve and the Treasury were doing, the federal government created what was called the Office of Price Administration, which was a which was a really robust federal entity that was charged with maintaining price controls across mm-hmm. the entire economy. Literally, the price of every single thing was was subject to regulation, and it was enforced. I mean, on the one hand, by you know a staff of like a hundred thousand federal employees, and on the other hand, by communities, mm-hmm. people women largely in different communities, policing the prices of things in stores, supermarkets, department stores, and and reporting violations and so on. And and all of this together allowed for enormous, enormous growth and stable prices, right? So, and and all the while, full employment, right? Mm -hmm. There's basically zero, I mean, there is literally zero unemployment during World War II. So we get to the end of the war. And a big question is what's gonna happen to this entire machinery? right, this entire economic infrastructure. And the labor movement, one of their biggest demands coming out of the war, and, you know, with the sort of haunted by the experience of the Depression, is that the federal government commit itself to full employment, to maintaining full employment in peacetime. The, the years after World War I were a disaster. There was a steep recession in, in, or depression, really, in, you know, in 1920-21. And that legacy left a mark on working people. And so the labor movement's like, all right, we got to have a full employment policy. The government's got to commit itself to maximum employment. 
We also want other things. We want national health insurance. We want more public housing. We want a lot of things, right? We want a decent society. The government's proven the ability to implement incredible change very quickly. And we want that to continue into peacetime. But how do we do that while maintaining price stability, while avoiding runaway inflation the way that they did during the war? And so maintaining price controls is one option for doing that, right? And there's a big, I mean, huge political struggle in 1946 over this. Are, what is the Office of Price Administration and these price controls, are they going to be maintained into peacetime? And business wages an incredible offensive against them, and ultimately they're dismantled. In 1946, the OPA uh, is ended, terminated, and prices soar. There's a st steep inflation in late 19 through 1946, and actually, that inflation is responsible largely for a Republican landslide in the 1946 midterms, which give us a, you know a Congress that passes most infamously the Taft Hartley Act, which mm -hmm. is still with us today and is one of the most anti labor pieces of legislation you know we've ever, we've seen. So going forward, though, in 1946, that Fed regime, right, of guaranteeing low cost debt to the federal government was still in place. Mm -hmm. The price controls are gone, inflation sk skyrocketing, but the maintenance of some kind of arrangement between the Federal Reserve and the Treasury is by liberals understood to be crucial mm -hmm. to the kinds of ambitions that they've got for the post-war period. But now we are in a climate of high inflation. In 1946, very high inflation, and then through the rest of the 40s, kind of threatening inflation. Inflation becomes a major political issue in the late 40s. And in this context, bankers, capitalists from a variety of industries, conservatives start waging a campaign to end this policy by the Federal Reserve to say the Fed should no longer act with the sole priority of ensuring that the government can borrow at reasonable rates, that the Federal Reserve should instead prioritize getting inflation under control, which means breaking with the previous commitment and raising interest rates as is needed. And this, this you know, through, you know, 1948, 49, 50, this is being fought out. And then as the Korean War begins, there's a new burst of federal spending. And now, it's sort of like center stage. Is the Fed going to continue this through the Korean War? Is this going to continue into perpetuity? Or is there going to be a shift? And in 1951, the capitalist class prevails. Mm -hmm. And the Fed abandons its, its commitment to maintaining low interest you know, um, conditions for the federal government. And it's called the you know, Fed Treasury Accord of 1951 is how it's remembered. And that's really the turning point. Now, they don't immediately like jack up interest rates through the roof. It's sort of a process after that. But that's the crucial um, inflection point in the Fed's history. I think what this is all kind of leading up to is um, you, you have a great line in your piece that is a little bit provocative. You write, in many ways, the Federal Reserve is the most powerful central economic planning agency the world has ever seen. So maybe talk a little bit about what that means and, and how that kind of plays out today. Yeah, yeah. And I, to be fair, I can't take credit for that because other, others have made a <laughs> similar point um, because it's true, mm -hmm. right? It is the case that the Federal Reserve is just an extraordinary um, entity for managing not just U.S., but global capitalism. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, this idea, I mean, it's kind of striking that in the, you know, in the neoliberal era, the age of the central bank has also been, you know, at least until recently, the age of market ideology, the idea mm -hmm. that the state ought not have any role in the economy. And while, in fact, these central banks, which are, you know, quasi, if not entirely public entities, superintend the entire system. Mm -hmm. So the Fed is, I would say, you know, the most powerful economic central planning agency because it has the ability to determine w what kinds of economic activity can occur. It has the ability to control who gets access to credit on what terms they get access to credit, which in turn conditions what kind of investment activity is going to take place. Mm -hmm. So, you know, at, they are really at the apex of a financial system that conditions all other economic activity. And and they have, I mean, it's a set of people who make decisions, mm -hmm. right? It's not, this isn't just like the market affecting these interest rates. They're going into a meeting, they're going to decide what they're going to do. And that, you know, then 
is transmitted through the entire economy. But I, I guess I should also say, you know, this point, I think, is important to emphasize because it also, I think, helps us push back against this idea that is, I think, a, a little bit too common in some circles, which is that the Fed is like a villain, right? The Fed right. is the biggest problem. And the Fed is actually a great thing. It's great that we have this thing, this public entity that can manage so much of our economic lives. Mm -hmm. It's not that the Fed's existence is not the problem. The problem is the interests that the Fed serves. Right. Uh, well, on the question of those interests, uh, you, you had mentioned Volcker trying to undermine organized labor in the 70s. And I want to maybe connect that to today. Uh, you know, we have talked already about how Jerome Powell has been, you know, very open about wanting to keep wages down, basically, or, or to suppress wages. Uh, do, does it seem like the Fed is sort of actively trying to suppress an incipient labor movement? I mean, because we've also been seeing, you know, ob obviously a tight labor market, but also a lot of union organizing is happening right now. And there's been a lot of attention to that. Uh, not to get too conspiratorial, uh, but but do they see it as a threat, I guess? Yeah, it's a great question. And, you know, I mean, to a certain extent, we're not going to know until we have access to, you know, the complete archives and we right. can really read what they've been talking about. Um, but it is the case, I think, and this this has been demonstrated by scholars over the years, that the Fed has historically, certainly since that Fed Treasury Accord in 1951, been very concerned about the labor movement's power. Mm -hmm. um, Volcker, you know, infamously carried around in his pocket like a little note card with upcoming contract negotiations. You know, he was very he was very mindful of, you know, where labor was, what labor was capable of achieving. He also, you know, said that Ronald Reagan's attack on the air traffic controllers in 1982 was sort of the missing piece to what hit to his campaign, mm -hmm. right? In addition to the program of monetary austerity, there needed to be in Volcker's mind, a full scale confrontation with organized labor. Mm -hmm. So Volcker very much understood, you know, things in these terms. And into the 90s, you know, the Fed, you, you know, Fed minutes demonstrate that some of these central bankers are still quite concerned about developments in the labor movement. After the, you know, the UPS strike in 1997, there's talk within the Fed about whether this is going to mark a turning point. You know, are, is Volcker's victory going to be reversed? Or, or is the American working class starting to revive itself? So this, this has been something that the you know central bankers think about today certainly powell is concerned with the wage what he sees as as dangerous wage pressure that could get more dangerous if expectations of inflation continue to persist whether he is whether he's thinking about it in terms of you know the organizing that we've been seeing mm -hmm. and the strikes and strike threats that we've been seeing it's hard to say. I, I suspect given, you know, how much time has passed and given how many hits the labor movement has taken, it's not front of mind to the same way that it was in the past, mm -hmm. even in the, even in 1997, when there was still living memory, you know, among a lot of central bankers of a more, um, you know, powerful labor movement. Mm -hmm. But I, I don't think we can really separate any of this. There's wage pressure, there's low unemployment, there's organizing activity, there's strike threats. I mean, I'm sure I would not at all be surprised if the rail, you know, the threatened rail strike is something that they're talking about right, right now. Right. You know, like this is, it's all part of the same kind of environment that they're concerned about. And, and, you know, I don't, again, just in the spirit of kind of pushing back against the Fed as villains model, I don't think that Volk or that Powell, you know, I, I, I think you, maybe we could believe that he's sincere in saying, look, I don't want to create massive pain for right. workers. He may he may really, you know, feel that. Mm -hmm. But but he's but he's willing to, you know, and, it, and, and if 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 it takes higher and higher rates that create a deep recession, he's willing he's he'd prefer that to the alternative. Mm -hmm. So let's maybe wrap up on this question of making the Fed not villains. Uh, and, and that's another way of saying, you know, what could a kind of left monetary policy agenda right now look like? And and a follow up, I, I feel like I have to ask is, you know, given that the Fed is not exactly a democratic institution, um, Samir, how exactly <laughs> do we go about uh, how do we read the Fed? <laughs> That right. That's the that's the multi trillion dollar question. <laughs> right. Well, I mean, let's uh, let's put it this way, right? Like, we want to see 
big public investment in mm -hmm. the United States. We want a Green New Deal. We want Medicare for all. We want more public housing, right? These are things that we need. And we have to be clear, right, that this kind of investment to meet the climate crisis does bring about the risk of generating inflationary pressure on its own, left on its own terms, right? The same way that in 1945, a full employment policy did bring on its own, bring the risk of inflation, same, same holds today. So the question then is how do we control inflation? Let's just put that to the side for one second. But setting, you know, we can come back to that. Any kind of major investment program like the one we need, which does, again, introduce potential inflationary risks, also requires that the federal government be able to finance the investment, mm -hmm. right? It's got, I mean, taxes are going to need to be a part of the equation, but so is credit. And in order for the government to borrow at reasonable rates that it can service through taxation over time, it's got to have a Fed that is cooperating with it in in making that happen. And we sort of saw a version of this early in the pandemic, right? The Fed was, I mean, took enormous steps in, in 2020 to facilitate, to stabilize credit conditions mm -hmm. and to ensure that all of the government spending through the CARES Act and the American Rescue Plan could be financed in a reasonable way. This, the, the fact, the Fed's position, you know, really from 2008 through 2020 is I think an important part of the context in which the Biden administration even thinks that things like Build Back Better are possible, right? Large scale investment like that, that's largely deficit finance, is possible in the Biden administration's mind because the Fed is gonna be able, is gonna be cooperating with them. Now that's changed, right? So I, I think, you know, what would a progressive central bank look like is one that sees the, its responsibility, not as combating inflation in the first place, but as supporting the federal government's efforts to invest in the things that we need. And then separate from that, we need a real inflation control program, perhaps modeled on the World War II model, right, that does take seriously the fact that there is pressure that needs to be managed. And the question then becomes, on in whose interest is it managed? Is it managed at the expense of profits? Is it managed at the expense of wages? And if it is managed at the expense of profits, then how do we compensate for that? Insofar as we live in a capitalist society, profitability is what encourages investment. And if we're gonna control profits, we have to confront the possibility that investment may not be forthcoming from private investors the way that we might need. And if that's the case, that brings us back to the need for government investment. And if we need government investment, that takes us back to how is the government going to finance it and the role of the Fed. So all of this is wound up together. But ultimately, the question of what a progressive Fed looks like is about, you know, it's what we want right. and what the Fed's priority should be mm -hmm. in relation to what we want. Now, the question of how we get the Fed to do that is a different one, mm -hmm. right? And it is the case, right, that the Fed is quite undemocratic, right? They're, you know, they're, the board members are meeting right now in private, mm -hmm. and they're not even going to tell us what they talked about for a little while. And they're going to, you know, they're going to raise interest rates by 0.75% tomorrow. And that's going to, you know, on top of a couple similar hikes over previous months, and that is going to have some kind of effect on all of our lives. And so we, we can't, we can't influence that, right? We just simply don't have the power to influence that. But I think what the historical you know, story tells us is that there are times where the Fed will respond to changing political conditions. I, also, it's worth saying, as undemocratic as the Fed is, you know, it is the, the board is appointed by, you know, Powell is appointed by Biden. He was appointed by Trump in the first place. These are presidential appointees. They serve six year terms. It's less un undemocratic than the Supreme Court. You know, <laughs> like, I mean, it is a more influenceable entity than the court. And and even even given that, you know, within that six year term, we don't have a lot of control over them. Again, the, the history reminds us that in certain times, under certain political conditions, mm -hmm. the Fed will or can be pushed to act in ways that, you know, align with what we're trying to accomplish. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, again, Samir's article is called Red the Fed. That's in the latest print issue of Jacobin. And I think it's up on the web now or should be soon. Uh, Samir, that was extremely enlightening. Uh, it's a great article. I uh, recommend everybody read it. Thanks so much for your time and great to see you as always. Thanks for having me, Jim. It's a pleasure.
If you like this video from The Jacobin Show, please hit like and subscribe and share with your friends. Thanks.